another edition of America's Godly Heritage. In this episode, we are going to be looking at part two of the Liberty Bell. In the previous edition, we reviewed how the old state house bell, as it was called then, was cast and cast and cast again because it didn't pass muster. It was begrudgingly hung in the Pennsylvania State House steeple and rung for all kinds of political, religious, and educational reasons. At some point, the ringing caused a crack to form in the bell, and an attempt was made to fix it. Despite the repairs, the bell became irreparably cracked during celebrations for George Washington's birthday in February 1846. Although it was now useless, the bell was not scrapped. It was beginning to take on a life of its own because it was becoming linked with the idea of freedom and with the abolitionist movement to free the slaves. Abolitionists were quite taken with the bell's inscription, which read, Proclaim liberty through all the land to all the inhabitants thereof. Leviticus 25.10 in the King James Version. The rest of the verse says, It shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. This verse refers to ancient Israel's year of jubilee, which was to be celebrated every 50 years and was when the slaves were to be set free. However, many abolitionists believed that when it says all slaves should be set free, it didn't just refer to the ones in ancient Israel, but also applied to the ones that were to be found in 19th century United States. Thus, they linked the old state house bell with the idea of freedom, in particular the freedom of the slaves. The bell was first called the Liberty Bell in the New York Anti-Slavery Society's publication, The Anti-Slavery Record, in February 1835. In an article titled, The Liberty Bell, the Society points out the tragic irony that the following inscription was on the bell when it was cast. It was considered a sort of prophecy, proclaim liberty throughout all the land, and to all the inhabitants thereof. May not the emancipationists in Philadelphia hope to live to hear the same bell rung, when liberty shall in fact be proclaimed to all the inhabitants of this favored land? Hitherto the bell has not obeyed the inscription, and its peals have been a mockery, while one-sixth of all the inhabitants are in abject slavery. Two years later, the Anti-Slavery Society published another work which was called Liberty, and which featured a picture of the old state house bell and the words, Proclaim Liberty to all the inhabitants. In 1839, abolitionists in Boston published the Liberty Bell, which was an annual gift book containing poems, essays, and articles by famous abolitionists and writers such as Elizabeth Barrett Browning, Alex de Tocqueville, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Lucretia Mott, and Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. In addition, William Lloyd Garrison's publication, The Liberator, reprinted an abolitionist poem titled The Liberty Bell. The poem pointed out that, despite its inscription, the bell did not proclaim liberty to all the inhabitants of the land. Soon after this, as the abolitionist cause was gaining momentum, the Liberty Bell cracked. What a fitting metaphor for the United States. The U.S. was supposed to be a country that stood for and celebrated freedom, yet some of the inhabitants were not free. This inner impurity led to the cracking and splitting of the nation, just like an inner impurity led to the cracking of the bell. Yet after much upheaval, both the bell and the nation have endured. Not to be outdone by the abolitionist movement, writer George Lepard also linked the bell with the Declaration of Independence in his short story, Fourth of July, 1776, which was published in the Saturday Courier on January 2, 1847. 
He describes an elderly bellman who was in the state house steeple, waiting and thinking and fearing that the Continental Congress would not have the courage to declare independence from Great Britain. But then his grandson appears and shouts to ring the bell. The story was not factually correct because on July 4th, no one knew that the declaration had actually happened and been approved. It was not read out publicly until July 8th. And then, not just the Liberty Bell, but all of the city's bells rang out for the rest of that day in celebration of the declaration. Despite this, the story became popular and was widely reprinted. Thus, the Liberty Bell and the Declaration of Independence became closely linked in the public mind. Even worse, historian Benson J. Lossing published the details of the story in his The Pictorial Fieldbook of the Revolution, which was then used in school primers as a history lesson. This fake news quickly spread even to the extent that in 1853, President Franklin Pierce visited Philadelphia, saw the bell, and spoke of it as representing the American Revolution and American liberty. Fake news aside, the bell, with its inscription about proclaiming liberty to all the land, captured the essence of the Declaration of Independence, which had been created and signed by the Continental Congress in the rooms just below where the Liberty Bell was located. With the rise of interest in the bell, in 1852 the city moved it to the room where the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution had been signed. In 1865, after President Lincoln had been assassinated and his body was being sent in state to Springfield, Illinois for burial, they actually stopped in Philadelphia for a while and his body laid in state in the assembly rooms, which is where the Liberty Bell was. The lines to see the coffin were never less than three miles long, and it's estimated that 120,000 to 140,000 people actually were able to go through and see Lincoln and pay respects to him. And right next to him was the Liberty Bell. This was quite apt, because as the mourners were able to go through, they saw the Liberty Bell, which reminded them that Lincoln had indeed brought liberty to all the inhabitants of the land. He had freed the slaves. To help heal the nation's wounds after the Civil War, the Liberty Bell traveled across the country, proclaiming liberty and traditional American freedoms, which citizens on both sides of the war, both on the North and the South sides, they could agree on these values. By 1876, the Liberty Bell was so popular it played a central role in the nation's centennial celebrations. During discussions about what role the Liberty Bell was going to play, some of Philadelphia's city leaders actually suggested that they repair the bell and fill in the cracks. Oh my gosh, can you imagine the Liberty Bell without its crack? So at least some of the city leaders said, no, that is not a good idea. We're not going to do that because the crack is part of the bell's character. And thank goodness they prevailed. So what the city did was they made another bell called the Centennial Bell, which weighed 13,000 pounds. That's 1,000 pounds for each of the original 13 colonies. And this was the bell that they then put up in the State House steeple. In the meantime, tens of thousands of Centennial visitors and tourists came and they viewed the Liberty Bell and they bought all kinds of Liberty Bell souvenirs ranging from pickle plates, spoons, buttons, pins, toothpick cups, you name it, the bell was on it. Between 1885 and 1915, the Liberty Bell made several trips to various expositions and celebrations, beginning with traveling to New Orleans for the World's Industrial and Cotton Centennial Exposition. When New Orleans city leaders requested the bell be part of their celebrations, Philadelphia Mayor William B. Smith recognized that the Liberty Bell could be a symbol of America's reunification 
and so the bell was loaded onto a special railroad car and sent to New Orleans. As the bell traveled south, it made many stops, and at every stop there were thousands of well-wishers, there were speeches and ceremonies all in celebration of this bell. Even Jefferson Davis, the former president of the Confederacy, viewed the bell and publicly declared, Glorious old bell, the son of a revolutionary soldier bows in reverence before you. The Liberty Bell made a similar transcontinental trip to Chicago for the World's Columbian Exposition in 1893. On a side note, the composer, John Philip Sousa, who was known for his military marches, also attended this exposition. There he watched a spectacle called America, which featured a backdrop with a giant Liberty Bell on it. Soon afterwards, he received a letter from his wife who told him that his son had participated in a parade honoring the Liberty Bell. Sousa took the hint and he named the piece he was working on at that moment in time the Liberty Bell. This march has been played at several presidential inaugurations, but it is best known as the theme tune for Monty Python's Flying Circus. Back to our story. The Liberty Bell made other journeys to Atlanta for the Cotton States and International Exposition in 1895 and 1896. To Charleston for the Interstate and West Indian Exposition in 1902. To Boston for the 128th anniversary of the Battle of Bunker Hill. To St. Louis for the Louisiana Purchase Exposition in 1904. All of this travel led to the bell developing another crack. Oh no! So, Philadelphia's city officials began to oppose further trips. However, since the city had already agreed to send the bell to San Francisco for the Panama Pacific Exposition, it agreed to honor this trip. It took preventative measures to protect the bell by installing a metal support system within the bell, which was nicknamed the Spider. The bell arrived safely in San Francisco, and in February 1915, it was tapped gently with wooden mallets three times to produce the sounds that were transmitted to the fair over telephone lines to open it. And the transmission also inaugurated the transcontinental telephone. After the San Francisco trip, all requests for the Liberty Bell to travel were denied. However, much to the horror of the city of Philadelphia and its leaders, they discovered that more damage was being done to the bell. But this time it was happening in Philadelphia. Apparently, the bell's guard was chipping off little pieces of the bell and selling it to souvenir hunters. So they placed the bell in a big glass case. For quite a while and then they changed it so that it was hung on its yoke in the tower room of Independence Hall. This room would remain the Liberty Bell's home until 1975 when it was moved into the Liberty Bell Interpretive Center on the grounds of Independence Hall. This center now houses the Liberty Bell and contains exhibits all about the Liberty Bell and about various quests for liberty. Throughout the 20th century, the Liberty Bell continued to be viewed as a potent symbol of freedom. Yet since the bell could no longer travel and go out into the world, the world came to it. For example, a replica of the bell was forged in 1915, and this Justice Bell was used to promote women's suffrage. It traveled across the country with the clapper chained to the side of the bell so it could not ring. It would not ring until women won the right to vote. On September 25, 1920, the bell was brought to Independence Hall and was rung in celebration of the passage of the 19th Amendment giving women the right to vote. During World War II, the Liberty Bell was used to sell war bonds to support freedom and to fight oppression. 
The bell was also gently tapped on D-Day in June 1944, on V-E Day in May 1945, and on V-J Day in August 1945 to celebrate the victory of freedom. The war also led to the idea of the Liberty Bell, that's bell with an E on the end. Some planes were named the Liberty Bell and a woman was painted on them. DC Comics also created a character called Liberty Bell, who first appeared in Boy Commandos No. 1 in the winter of 1943. This featured journalist Liddy Lawrence, who had superpowers, which had been activated by the ringing of the Liberty Bell, and she helped fight the evil Axis powers. After the war, she continued to fight evil in whatever form it took. The Liberty Bell then became a symbol of freedom during the Cold War. It was a symbol of a 1950 savings bond campaign to help strengthen the U.S. financially in its efforts to thwart communism. In 1955, former residents of Eastern European nations tapped the bell to encourage those still trapped behind the Iron Curtain. Foreign dignitaries whose people were fighting oppression, such as Israeli Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion and West Berlin Mayor Ernst Reuter, visited the bell. It even became part of the space race against the Soviet Union. As part of the Mercury program, astronaut Gus Grissom said his space capsule looked like the Liberty Bell, so that's what he named it. He even painted a white crack down its side. The Liberty Bell 7 launched on July 21, 1961 and spent 15 minutes in space before returning to Earth and landing in the Atlantic Ocean. During the 1960s, the bell was the site of several protests for freedom and liberty, particularly by those supporting the civil rights movement and by those both supporting or opposing the Vietnam War. In his famous I Have a Dream speech, the civil rights leader, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., used the phrase, let freedom ring, many times. He references the patriotic hymn, My Country Tis of Thee, but I'm sure that with his knowledge of the abolitionist movement of the 1800s and the civil rights movement of the 1900s and their calls for the Liberty Bell to ring and proclaim freedom to all the inhabitants of the land, that he was also referencing a call for the Liberty Bell to ring in this passage. Here is an excerpt of his speech. Let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi. From every mountainside. Georgia, Tennessee, and Mississippi were all states that were still oppressing minorities, and Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. wanted the Liberty Bell to ring and declare freedom to all the inhabitants of the land. The bell was, and still is, a focal point for oppressed groups to find hope, to communicate their predicament, and to proclaim their call for freedom. When the United States celebrated its bicentennial in 1976, the Liberty Bell was once again a popular symbol of patriotism, and souvenirs of all shapes and sizes were plastered with the iconic bell. As part of the celebrations, the British government commissioned the Whitechapel Bell Foundry, which had cast the Liberty Bell, to cast the Bicentennial Bell, which was then gifted to the United States. How ironic that Great Britain, the nation we had once fought for our freedom, had become our greatest ally in the fight for liberty around the world. The Bicentennial Bell is inscribed for the people of the United States of America from the people of Britain. Fourth of July, 1976. Let freedom ring. Due to its link with American values, such as patriotism and freedom, 
and due to its continued popularity with nearly all Americans, the government, corporations, schools, and even sports teams have associated themselves with the Liberty Bell. It has been etched on coins and stamps. It is displayed on food products like cranberries, butter, chocolate, peanuts, soup, pretzels, and coffee. It has been incorporated into household items such as clocks, lamps, soap, paperweights, and bookends. The bell has been displayed in fun items like pinball machines, train sets, puzzles, and cookie jars. It appears on clothing and accessories such as earrings, watches, t-shirts, hoodies, and even Halloween costumes. The Liberty Bell is also featured on corporate logos ranging from banks to insurance agencies to real estate agencies to delivery services to restaurants. The final takeaway. The Liberty Bell did not have the most auspicious of beginnings. It broke the first time they struck it, so they had to recast it. Then it sounded terrible, so they had to recast it again. Then it was used so much and so irritated the residents who lived near the Pennsylvania State House that they actually petitioned the assembly to stop ringing it so much. Then it developed a huge crack, which they tried to fix, but the crack just got worse. This imperfect bell should have been thrown away but instead it became a symbol for an imperfect country. This broken bell became a symbol of healing for a broken nation. This ugly sounding bell became a clarion call for the sweet sound of freedom. And why? Because the Liberty Bell features a powerful verse from the Bible, one that was chosen for its prophetic declaration. Proclaim liberty through all the land to all the inhabitants thereof. Leviticus 25.10 This call to proclaim the light of liberty into the darkness of oppression is as pertinent today as it was 300 years ago when the bell was first made. God had a plan for America. He wanted America to be a land of liberty and to be a land that sent out liberty into the rest of the world. America, let freedom ring. Thank you for listening to this edition of America's Godly Heritage. We hope you have a great day. Bye. If you would like to help support America's Godly Heritage or to view the resources used to make this podcast, just go to patreon.com or vimeo.com and type America's Godly Heritage in the search box. You can also make financial donations at givesendgo.com. Again, just type America's Godly Heritage in the search box. We really appreciate your support. Thanks again. Bye.